looks like battery land. These hyper-realistic simulations show you what the weather will look and feel like before it happens. Feel the forecast, streaming on CBS News. We're really excited that we've been honored with the Emmy Award for Outstanding Live News Program. But we know we couldn't have done that without you. So thank you. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7 on CBS. The news doesn't have to always be depressing. What do you love about running? Energy! It can be uplifting. That human connection that we create on the broadcast every night is incredibly important. The president's decision to end the war in Afghanistan was the right one. It is also undeniable that decisions made and the lack of planning done by the previous administration significantly limited options available to him. You see this guy in Manhattan, this district attorney, they're weaponizing the prosecutorial power to advance a political agenda. When you're losing by 10 points, there is a messaging issue. This is not an issue that's going away for our party in a post-ops world, and we can't put our head in the sand and think it's going to heading into 2024. Welcome to Red and Blue. I'm Nancy Cordes in Washington. Thank you so much for joining us. The White House today made public an internal review summarizing the 2021 U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. The report included the bombing at Kabul Airport's Abbey Gate, which killed 13 U.S. service members. This report, which was long anticipated, repeatedly blamed the Trump administration for the chaotic withdrawal, noting that Mr. Trump agreed to a withdrawal date and started drawing down troops, but did not provide the Biden team with an actual withdrawal plan during the presidential transition. Joining us now to discuss this report further is CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe and CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland. Ed, I'm going to start with you because it's pretty clear what the main point was that they were trying to make here. It's in paragraph two of the unclassified summary that we received. It says, quote, President Biden's choices for how to execute the withdrawal were severely constrained by conditions created by his predecessor. In other words, as John Kirby put it, the previous administration tied our hands. So it took them almost two years to draw that conclusion. Did they take any responsibility or acknowledge any mistakes made by the Biden administration? The word mistake appears once in this 12-page report, uh, Nancy, uh, noting that um, when, in, in essence, recounting that strike that occurred in central Kabul that was intended to kill an ISIS-K operative and ended up killing 10 civilians. They say, quote, to counter the perceived immediate threat, the U.S. military launched a drone strike in Kabul that mistakenly killed 10 civilians. Among the causes of this tragic error was that the high-risk and dynamic threat environment led the team to inaccurately assess that the targeted posed an imminent threat to those on the ground. That's the one time we see the word mistake uh, on an incident in all of this that, of course, has been well documented and for which the U.S. has apologized before. But it spends three and a half pages laying it out and saying it's the Trump administration's fault for negotiating with the Taliban, for inviting them to Camp David, for withdrawing U.S. forces to, a, to such a level that you would have had to send more in rather than keep it at those numbers, and for not allowing the, United, the Biden administration to see those plans during that botched transition, you'll recall, in late 2020, when the Biden transition teams are trying to get information from agencies and the Trump administration was blocking them from doing so. But this is, they called it, or National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said they were going to do a hot wash, which is a fancy bureaucratic term for a deep dive into what went wrong. This 12-page document is a whitewash. There is, <laughs> it, it is narrative. It is light on specifics. Uh, it's devoid of citations. And it is, in essence, uh, their version of events as the classified reports conducted by the State Department and the Pentagon are being sent to lawmakers on the relevant committees for their full review, White House saying it will not release those classified reports to the general public, although inevitably details of those reports likely will ultimately somehow get out there in the public sphere. We'll wait and see how it went. And we've been waiting for this report and asking about this report 
for months and months. And so I want to ask you, Ed, about the timing of this release on Passover before the Easter weekend. That's something that you touched on in this very pointed question to White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby. So let's take a listen to that. Why today? And is this all we get? And is this a response to the studies that were done by the agencies? Or is this considered a summary? This is the result of months and months of work by individual agencies who are participating in the withdrawal to voluntarily review that withdrawal, which they did. Um, and uh, they worked through that. Uh, these, are, uh, these documents are classified. Um, and we felt it was the responsible thing to do after those reviews were done to then run a process across the administration to take a look at those reviews ourselves across the interagency, uh, work our way through it, uh, and then provide them to the relevant committees and leaders uh, uh, on the Hill, which we did today. We think that was the responsible thing to do. And what you're seeing today is the result and the culmination of an awful lot of work, Ed. No uh, effort here to try to obfuscate or try to bury something. It's an effort to try to be as open, as transparent as we can be. So, Ed, he said that if, uh, if you weren't going to bury something, you wouldn't release it uh, right before a holiday weekend. He says no burying here. What'd you make of that? Well, and it's, this is the definition of a news dump. Uh, it, viewers of this program may be familiar with that great show, The West Wing, on which everyone compares presidencies now. And there was this great episode about taking out the trash day. When you try to release information and news that you don't want to get wider attention, you do it on a Friday or you do it ahead of a holiday weekend. This is that. The other thing they did this afternoon, for example, is the Education Department releasing a proposed change in Title IX policy regarding transgender athletes that, in essence, will allow some school districts across the country to ban transgender athletes against the wishes and the whims of supporters of this administration. So another piece of trash taken out today by the White House, as they might describe it in raw communication strategy sense. Uh, this is not something that the White House is eager to remind people about. The withdrawal from Afghanistan that deadly day at the airport when 13 U.S. service members were killed, the chaos that was seen on television is arguably the lowest point, the biggest mistake or stumble of this administration. And so while they want to try to claim that they were doing this voluntarily and that they released it today, releasing it during a holiday week and spring break season, mm -hmm. and doing it knowing that Congress was going to do it for them if they didn't, uh, you know, is, is uh, too cute by half, perhaps. And, Scott, it also did not go unnoticed that they released this report during a congressional recess. So there's no one on Capitol Hill to read the classified version of the report. In fact, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee is in China, on the other side of the world. He was probably asleep when this report came out. Uh, we have the first reaction from Chairman McCall, who called Kirby's comments, quote, insulting and disgusting. What was he referring to, and what else is he saying? Yeah, he was referring to Admiral Kirby's statement as disgraceful and insulting, that he was trying to ascribe blame to the previous administration for what happened during the withdrawal. Um, but I think you put your finger on it. You have a double-decker bus of criticism incoming from Congress because there's a policy difference the Republicans in Congress have had with the administration over this. But now they have a process complaint, too. That's where the double-decker comes from. And you know Congress is always at its most unbridled and unambiguous when it is firing back about process issues, when they don't believe they're getting the information they've been entitled to at the timing of their choosing. And what Chairman McCall also said today, in addition to calling um, Kirby's statements disgraceful, was that he believes it was his request for information, his forceful request for information about the Afghan withdrawal that led the White House to release this at all. Timing is not going to be... Um, unnoted by people here in Congress that this happens when they are not here, when they're decentralized. But the House Oversight Committee has already announced, Nancy, an April 19th hearing into this. This committee, the House Oversight Committee, generally has oversight over the entirety of the federal government. So they have some small piece of this. They will not be the last panel to request testimony and have an investigative hearing about this matter. Right. And Republicans have been saying, even before they got the gavel, that they were going to be doing a deep dive into the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. So what are they going to do with this report? And, and 
how does this report feed into the partisan back and forth over this two-year-old withdrawal? At first, they've got to read it, and that's no small matter. It's quite clear to me members of Congress have not gotten through this thing yet because we haven't heard granular criticisms of what's inside, just the same summary that's been released to others. Um, how does this infuse the debate? Well, let's look first of all at who gets called to testify. The first hearing that's been put on the books immediately at the House Oversight Committee is really just talking to a special inspector general who has long tracked Afghanistan and U.S. efforts there. Not a key player in the decision making from the Biden administration. Let's see who gets called next. Which players in which decisions are called to testify before Congress because that might direct how the U.S. House responds and ultimately even how the Democratic led U.S. Senate response. Well, it's a, a document that's fascinating for what it doesn't include as much as what it doesn't, uh, as much as what it does, rather. Uh, Ed O'Keefe and Scott McFarland, thank you so much for breaking it down for us today. Up next, we're going to go back to Nashville, where the state house has voted to expel a Democrat over a recent protest over guns after that deadly school shooting. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Hey there, welcome to the uplift. I thought she was a groom. And I stepped back and I went, oh, you're the queen. She's going to be with me every instant that I'm alive. I just wanted to see if you'd go to Disneyland with me today. I look over at him and he's smiling. I'm going to remember that the rest of my life. They told us when he was going to be born, he was only going to live for 30 minutes. It's really a miracle that he's with us today. The Uplift, stream now on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. An original documentary from CBS Reports. I always tell people that Twitter would not be Twitter without black Twitter. It's just us being in fellowship with each other. And it becomes a conversation you don't want to be left out of. People really started to recognize the power of activism on Twitter. Based on that one tweet, the hashtag Oscar so white was trending around the world. If anything has really powered black Twitter, it's been humor. If your food ain't right, oh, we gonna tell you about that too. So we tend to create change, create culture and cool. That's how movements happen on black Twitter and go beyond more than that. Black Twitter, the Twitterverse that changed a generation. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. You ready? A generation of kids opens up on CBS Reports. I just want to be like a regular kid. Their world, their struggles, their voices. What if I was white? A lot of people like to call names and make you feel ashamed for being proud of who you are. Now streaming gender. I did not realize that you could change your gender. Realizing how you feel. You can be a boy, and sometimes you feel like a girl, sometimes you feel like both. Redefining who you are. Identify as trans. Gender fluid. Non-binary and queer. Is the idea of gender a thing of the past? And to be yourself, always, no matter what anyone says, I love you. Are the kids all right? Gender, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Stories that inform. Or you can be really old at 60, and you can be really young at 85. Inspire. How do we unlock the power within ourselves to be who we want to be? And brighten your day. The best part of fame is making people feel good. Always send the people home happy. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream now on the free CBS News app. The news doesn't have to always be depressing. What do you love about running? Energy! Energy! It can be uplifting. That human connection that we create on the broadcast every night is incredibly important. Two, Representative Justin Jones was expelled by the Tennessee House of Representatives today, and two more Democrats in Tennessee's House could be removed from office today. The Republican majority is seeking to expel them for taking part in an anti-gun protest in the state's capital. State reps joined protesters who flooded the House chamber following the mass shooting at a private school in Nashville last week. 
This is a really startling development. So CBS News political correspondent Caitlin Huey, Huey Burns joins me now to discuss it. So, Caitlin, just walk us through what this means. They voted to expel mm -hmm. one Democratic lawmaker, mm -hmm. uh, which seems like a very severe punishment Absolutely. for, no question, breaking the rules, mm -hmm. but breaking the rules in a fairly mundane way. They participated in a yeah. protest on mm -hmm. the state legislature's floor. So th is this person now gone? Right. Well, this person is now expelled, which means their constituents won't have representation. For how long? A special election has to be called by the governor, so mm -hmm. that's uncertain. If all three of them end up being expelled, that's about 200,000 people who won't have representation in the state legislature. State legislature, which, by the way, is not too far away from that Covenant School in Nashville, right. uh, where this shooting occurred, as you mentioned, just a, a week ago. Um, I was just listening to the House floor um, and those speaking in defense of these lawmakers. And they were making the point that this is just a huge, um, uh, you know, not even a sanction, just beyond what you would normally do in any sort of circumstance. One lawmaker speaking in defense was essentially saying people um, have done worse and have gotten away with worse. Um, and what's really interesting here is that this is a measure that is hardly taken. I was just looking right. at the Tennessean, um, and they said that this happened once in 2016. That person was expelled for sexual misconduct, another in 1980. But before that, it hadn't happened since the Civil War. Uh, so there really isn't a big precedent for this. This is really history-making. Um, and, uh, you know, you need about two-thirds majority to vote them out, and they surpass that number. Um, and this is an issue, of course, that we've seen um, is especially raw, especially emotional. Uh, one of the um, uh, lawmakers who's facing expulsion was a teacher herself. Uh, so speaking to that kind of issue, um, so just extraordinary what is happening on the floor right now. And as you pointed out, it doesn't just affect these lawmakers. It right. affects every person who voted mm -hmm. for them, basically saying your votes don't matter. And we've covered U.S. Congress mm -hmm. uh, for years, and we've seen all kinds of shenanigans yeah. on the House floor. And you yeah. imagine if everyone who participated in a protest yeah. got kicked out of Congress, we'd have very few <laughs> members of Congress at this point. There are a yeah. lot of other punishments available mm -hmm. to the state legislature that exactly. don't go as far as expelling a it member of the legislature, a duly elected member of the legislature. Exactly. And we've seen it in instances before in state houses where people have been censured, uh, reprimanded, um, taken off committee assignments. Um, but you bring up a really interesting point, which is that you cannot do this in U.S. Congress. You cannot um, expel a member of Congress unless you have two-thirds majority, but that's such a high bar. Right. In Tennessee, they have a super... Republicans have a super majority, so getting to that threshold was much easier. Um, but it's, you know, speaks to... and you. Can can see on the, 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 the protests that have happened uh, as well, um, it speaks to this issue that we've been talking about for the past week of what do you do in the wake of a mass shooting? What can Congress do? What can state legislatures do? And here is an example of someone who their defense, Representative Jones, said, you know, he was speaking on behalf of his constituents who felt like they needed this kind of voice um, mm -hmm. in the chamber at that point. What argument are the Republicans who push this expulsion through making uh, on the floor of the state legislature today for yeah. why they felt it was necessary to take well, this Well, they step. have said that this uh, breached protocol breached the rules. Um, there have been some quotes comparing it to an insurrection of sorts. Of course, this is by no means comparable because you haven't had, um, you know, many, 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 many people arrested. Uh, this was a and peaceful protest. This was a peaceful protest. It was essentially going to the well of the chamber, um, these three. And uh, Representative Jones was the one that had happened to be speaking first. And so he is first up here. Um, so, you know, and, and, and again, um, they Need, needed two-thirds majority, and they uh, really, you know, they outpaced the number that they needed. Right. And there, there's no question that in recent years uh, there has been increased tension yeah. over security issues surrounding state legislatures, yeah. the U.S. Capitol, mm -hmm. more threats. You can yeah. understand why, uh, why tempers would be 
riding high. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, this is a, an example, though, of um, a situation where, you know, uh, there was also video and then there are also concerns about how that video was taken and whether that vid taking that video breached mm -hmm. any sort of uh, decorum as well. So that's also some of the battle lines that have been uh, discussed here. But we're waiting to see what happens uh, with these three other lawmakers, uh, two other lawmakers. Um, but again, uh, you know, just huge reaction, especially when you have um, you know, a lot of the country wondering what to do legislatively in the wake of school shootings, whether right. it's restrictions on guns, heightened security at schools. Um, this seems to be the course of action that this particular legislature is taking. Wow. Well, it's really startling to see um, uh, and clearly a disappointment for all those Tennesseans who cast those yeah. votes. Caitlin Huey Burns, thank you so much Good for getting you. us up to speed. Appreciate it. Good to see you. With Trump world still buzzing over his arraignment, what this week has meant for the 2024 GOP presidential field. Robert Costa joins us next. You're streaming Red and Blue, reporting across the political divide. An original documentary from CBS reports. Controversial Congressman George Santos. Why won't you answer our questions? How did he manage to get elected? Thank you very much. God bless you and God bless the USA. George Santos' campaign was a campaign of deceit, lies, and fabrication. And who is he, really? I knew him as Anthony DeVolder from Queens. Really, who he is, he's a fraud. I compare him to the Tinder swindler. From people who know him, the truth, the facts, the lies. He would say that he was worth $100 million. It's an incredibly cynical episode in American politics, beyond satire. Had you ever seen anything like this? No, and I hope I never see it again. Campaign of Deceit, now streaming on the free CBS News app. She dazzled on the court and off the court as a businesswoman. Thank you for joining us on Person to Person, tennis superstar and entrepreneur, Serena Williams. An original CBS Reports documentary. I asked my students, what are we going to do about racism in the United States? The backlash over teaching about racism in American schools. I don't think it has any place in the classroom. We can either pretend and say, no, we're not racist and we're all great people, or we can actually start to do the really, really hard work of addressing it. How did you lose your job? I made the statement that white privilege is a fact. Is it helping diversity and inclusion? When you bring in different people's stories experience it enriches education if you don't talk about something it doesn't go away or driving us further apart what schools are doing to our children in the name of anti-racism is in fact teaching them racism the intention is to put us in this war against no. each other an original cbs reports documentary streaming now Original CBS Reports documentary. I was entitled to equal pay or equal work under the law. Does the Supreme Court's power need to be checked? Nine Supreme Court justices, five of them said no, she's not entitled. That's not right. Calls to fix the court tend to go along with the politics of the moment. Republican appointed justices have all tended to go in one direction, with the Democratic appointed justices tending to go in another. Even though it's only nine justices, it takes five of them to make the law of the land. Does it have political impact? True. Political intent? Probably not true. If the American people don't trust the judgment of their court, that's a real problem for our democracy. An original CBS Reports documentary, streaming now. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Welcome back to Red and Blue. Former Vice President Mike Pence will not appeal a ruling requiring him to testify before a grand jury as part of the special counsel investigation into the January 6th riot at the Capitol. 
for more on what this means, as well as the 2024 GOP presidential race and some news about a surprising new entrant into the 2024 race. I'm joined by CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa. Robert, thank you so much for being here. So what does this news about Mike Pence mean for the special counsel investigation. It's a significant development in the January 6th federal investigation of Trump and his allies about January 6th because now you're getting someone who talked to Trump again and again in the run-up to the Capitol attack about the scheme Trump had tried to put in place to stay in power. Pence had one-on-one -on -one conversations with Trump about that, about that so-called Eastman plan written by conservative lawyer John Eastman. And Pence has been so careful for so many years about not disclosing what Trump has said to him in private. Now he has said by a judge's order that he will testify, he won't contest it anymore, and he will talk about some of those conversations. The judge is saying, you don't have to talk about your role in Congress on January 6th, mm -hmm. but you do have to talk about any illegal acts. And so this creates such a political minefield for Mike Pence as he decides whether to run for president. Because He's been in that minefield for quite some he time. He has. He has a lot of experience with it, perhaps more than anyone else. And yet he has been so careful uh, to, to be very measured in his criticism of the former president. And now he's going to uh, potentially uh, go in there and, and spill secrets that he hasn't told anyone about for years. I bet Pence wouldn't say he's going to spill any tea uh, or secrets on Trump, but he's going to recount conversations. And even if he does not believe there was criminal intent in those conversations, that won't be up to Pence to ultimately conclude. Right. The special counsel and the grand jury will move toward a conclusion at some point. What I'm really curious about is what does Pence say to the grand jury about January 5th, 2021, the eve of the insurrection where Pence had that now almost infamous Oval Office meeting with Trump one on one. That was the peak of the pressure campaign on Pence. I remember during the course of my reporting, someone told me that when Pence walked out of the Oval Office on January 5th on the evening, he looked almost uh, white as a ghost. Uh, like someone said, compared him to someone being at a hospital getting bad news, mm -hmm. kind of the drained look because he had just been through this arduous conversation with the president of the United States. Well, what did Trump say? We don't really know. We've had some reporting on it about a tough conversation they had about Trump really leaning on Pence to do his bidding. But what exactly was said under oath is something entirely different. The special counsel could get that. Uh, it's obviously been a challenging week for the former president, for the people around him. Uh, you talk to them often. How is Trump world feeling about his 2024 bid after his indictment and after the news that they got about uh, his former running mate and vice president? Projecting confidence, but the key word there is projecting. I mean, mm -hmm. they know that Nikki Haley, the former U.N. ambassador, has just announced she has raised $11 million. So it's not like that campaign is flagging. She's not catching up to Trump in any way in the polls, but she's showing at least financially an ability to compete. They know that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has been generally supportive of Trump during this moment of uh, legal crisis. But DeSantis hasn't seemed to waver from running down the line, whether he announces in the late spring or summer. That remains to be determined. And they still see DeSantis as a real threat should he jump into the race. You had a real bombshell yesterday, which is uh, not only that uh, RFK Jr., uh, the son of uh, Robert F. Kennedy, grandson of John F. Kennedy, is, is planning to get into this presidential race as a Democrat, um, well, announcing nephew, in Boston. The nephew, nephew, Jake, nephew yeah. You're right, sorry. Uh, uh, getting into the race later this month, announcing in Boston, but also that Steve Bannon, mm. the GOP provocateur, uh, was leaning on him, encouraging him heavily to do this. And Bannon Tell hasn't been hiding it. If you listen to Bannon's uh, television show, podcast, radio show, it's called The War Room, and it doesn't get a lot of mainstream attention, but it is sometimes a signal mm -hmm. of what's happening on that wing of the right, the kind of the far right of the GOP. And Bannon has been encouraging Robert F. Kennedy on air in terms of his anti-vaccine campaign for months, if not years now, promoting RFK Jr.'s book that was highly critical of Dr. Anthony Fauci. And you see Bannon privately, based on our reporting at CBS News, being someone who has told Robert F. Kennedy and his associates in various ways that a run for the presidency could be viable in terms of bringing together that anti-vax coalition in the Democratic race. Of course, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. against an incumbent like President Biden, uh, even 
even Robert F. Kennedy Jr. fans would acknowledge that's a long shot of long shots. But it is notable politically in the sense that there is a segment of this country mm -hmm. that is anti-vaccine, uh, angry about what happened during the pandemic, and no one has really tried to politically activate them for the 2024 race up until this moment. Now RFK Jr. is going to test whether that's an actual coalition. And you don't have to get a lot of votes to be a spoiler. You know, he's somebody who, whether or not he has a huge constituency, he has a lot of name recognition. There are Democrats who recall his environmentalism, maybe don't know as much about, uh, you know, the, the accusations against him uh, for spreading misinformation about vaccines. And it's clear that someone like Bannon would love for RFK Jr. to potentially be the Ralph Nader of 2024. And we don't know about the rest of the 2024 race. Does DeSantis actually run or not? Mm -hmm. Does Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, or Larry Hogan, the former Maryland governor, decide to run as a third party, no labels ticket? This is something that's in the discussion, at least among some donors. Manchin hasn't dismissed the idea outright in any way. So we're looking at a very unsettled 2024 presidential race where the former president is not only facing a possible trial in New York, but a possible indictment for conspiracy on the federal level, all while this no labels group hovers over a possible third party campaign. And as RFK Jr. tries to stoke the anti-vax movement into a, a real political activist group uh, that has political power. Uh, how this all plays out, all as President Biden, who you cover every day, hasn't yet put a fine point on when he's announcing, means we're in a moment, a crossroads of uncertainty. Right. A lot of questions in the Democratic Party about when exactly and if he will. And Governor Newsom of California is making a lot of trips around the country, not running, but certainly getting his name out there. No question. He's uh, waiting in the wings. Robert Costa, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And you'll be hosting Face the Nation this weekend. Well, that does it for today. You can stream Red and Blue Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News. Thanks for watching. In today's Money Watch, business analyst Jill Schlesinger is here to help. How do you even begin to make the best use of your money? If you've got a match from your employer, Ooh. don't give away that money. Dollar, dollar, Jill, y'all. CBS Mornings.